You've been thinking this is not enough gifting, this is not enough talent, it's not enough money, it's not enough time. I don't have enough. And Jesus is whispering in your ear tonight, you got enough. When you say, I am not enough, it makes you pray harder. It makes you seek harder. It makes you ask for more grace. Yeah, it sucks. But this is going to be sanctifying. Yeah, it's hard, but somehow healing's coming out of this. It's time to get up, step up, step out in faith, take a risk, do what God has called you to do, become who God has called you to become. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't let fear, doubt or negativity keep you here trapped. It's time to cross over. It's time to break camp. It's time to advance and go in and possess the promises of God. I was 17 years old, I laid down and went to sleep. And while I was sleeping, I dreamed. I was reading a verse that I didn't know existed at the time. God was saying to a young man, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, or I ordained thee and I sanctified thee to be a prophet to the nations. And when I woke that morning, I just took my Bible with, with childlike faith and just let it fall open. And it fell open on Jeremiah. And he said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee and I ordained thee and I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nations. And all of a sudden I remembered all the stories my mother told me about when I was born, I was born with a veil over my face and then one of the neighbors came down and said, look, the Lord has given you a prophet. And mama said, a prophet? She said, yeah, he has a veil over his face. Thin membrane born over some baby's faces. I was one of them. That membrane, the old folks said, was a sign you were a prophet, but I didn't know I was a prophet. So I was a wild, crazy, foolish, ignorant, rambunctious kid who got into everything and anything all the time, driving people crazy. And I was having a good time doing my own thing until God came along and messed it all up by bringing this stuff up here about me being a preacher. And I ran from my calling. I purposely got drunk and went wild and got high and partied and did everything I could to convince him to go away. Get one of them people with the little doilies on their head and the long skirts on and the no makeup who pray all day and talk in tongues all the time and leave me alone because I am not one of them. I'm crazy. I'm ignorant. I'm wild. I'm uncouth. I will embarrass you. I will disgrace you. Please don't call me. This is not going to be good for you and it's not going to be good for me and we should not do this together. <laughs> but God didn't ask me to vote. He asked me to obey. And after several years of running, I, and after several years of going in clubs and sitting on bar stools where one drunk would lean over to me and say, funny man, I had the craziest dream about you. I, I dreamed you was preaching in this church and, and I got up and ran out of the club. <laughs> And I felt like, David, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. And if I take the wings of the morning and ascend to the uttermost parts of the earth, thou art there. And I'm not going to be able to outrun this. And I couldn't understand that God wouldn't let me go. I couldn't understand why God picked me. If I get to heaven and we're only allowed one question apiece, I simply want to know, why did you call me? A boy from the hills of West Virginia the son of a janitor and a school teacher. Why did you call me? And I had lots of excuses. I, like Moses, I, I, I had a, a, a speech impediment. You, you, you can't call me. I, you, can't, you can't call me. I didn't stutter, but I had a lisp. I can't be a speaker because I have a lisp. But all of us have areas where we feel inadequate. And if you don't, you're disqualified. Because humility is framed from feeling inadequate. When you say, I am not enough, it makes you pray harder. It makes you seek harder. It makes you ask for more grace. Beware of all the people who tell you they are enough. 
it's a sure sign that you're dealing with a fraud. Because the questions the world is asking are too complicated for you to answer with a degree. The problems people are having now require divine intervention. And you have to have somebody who has heard from God, not from themselves. So it doesn't matter. In my weakness, he's made strong. In, in my weakness, his strength is validated. So he chooses fragile, broken, limited people so you won't be confused where the ointment comes from. You know that the glory that we have is not of ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord that has given us the glory and it's him coming out of us. It's not our talent coming out of it. It's not our skill coming out of it. It is him coming out, both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. That's the facts. And what makes God all the more real is recognizing that he can work with such poor material. That he, could, that he can be so masterful as Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel with a broken brush. And I am the brush. And you are the brush. And you are the brush. And you are the brush. And he chooses broken brushes so that there will be no glory to the brush. Only to the artist. When... The master, the master vintner plans to transplant you. Arguing will not stop it. He will not let you go until he's moved you to the place that he has prepared for you and you for it. And placing you in that place, you begin to grow. And you will know you're in the place when like Joseph, your branches reach over walls. When God plants you, your branches reach over every denominational, racial, generational wall that ever stood. And I believe he wanted you to hear this at this moment in your life. Jerry and I, my husband and I, we've been married nearly 20 years now. I can't believe that. And we have three sons that we are raising. They are giant. They are giants, y'all. My 15-year-old is six foot two inches tall. His 14-year-old brother is six foot two inches tall. Um, their nine-year-old brother is coming up right after them. They are some big boys. And one of the things I do for these boys, in fact, you should know that my full-time job is feeding the boys. That is my full <laughs> time job. I am trying to figure out any which way I can differently to cook chicken for dinner every single night, just like y'all. That's exactly what I'm doing. So we just do sports and everything with the boys, and they're growing up so quick. So one of the things that I have done since my oldest was five, I started when he was five, um, I went to uh, Ross Dress for Less in the backhand corner, left-hand side. There is a one row that has books and journals and those sorts of things. I went and I grabbed um, three journals hardback journals. They were just little, little, um, with the little spine, spiral spines, nothing real fancy, $4.99. I picked one for each boy. I've had it ever since my oldest was five. And at that age, I started to record a journal for them. I do not write in it every week or every month or even, um, you know, just on a regular basis. It's just when something happens, I don't want to forget or they say something that's really interesting, or I see the hand, the handiwork, the fingerprints of God in their life in some way, I kind of write it down. My, my goal is to have a collection of writings and thoughts and, and love letters really to my boys about their life that I hand over to them when they're you know, mature enough to appreciate it. Or better yet, I might just hand it over to their wives and say, girl, this is what you're getting yourself into right here. And because my oldest will be 16 next month, I was looking through his journal and came across a story from when he was five. I read it with fond memories because it was the, the little journal entry I put in there about him losing his first tooth. He'd wiggled that tooth and wiggled it. He couldn't wait for it to come out. 
And the reason he couldn't wait for it to come out is because we had told him that when your tooth comes out, the tooth fairy will come. <laughs> she will come and she will replace the tooth with a treasure. So he could not wait. Finally, the tooth came out, and that is my boy still to this day that, that has never been eager to go to sleep. But that night, he dove into bed at bedtime. He could not wait. He put the tooth underneath the pillow. He laid his head down, and he was, he was trying to go to sleep, but every three to five seconds, he would look under the pillow <laughs> to see if anything had happened. Finally, he did fall asleep. We let some time pass, and then about three o'clock in the morning or so, the six foot two, 250 pound tooth fairy that I sleep next to every night. He got up, he went upstairs, and he replaced the tooth for a treasure. In the morning, I knew when Jackson, and at the time we just had Jackson and Jerry Jr. At, I knew when they got up, I knew I could hear it. I could hear the excitement, the squeals, I could hear the stomps on the floor, I could hear the eagerness and enthusiasm because the tooth fairy had come and left the treasure. They bounded down the stairs into the room. Jackson's fists were both clenched closed. He ran up to me and said, Mom, the tooth fairy came. She left me a treasure. I said, buddy, let me see what she left you. Opened up one hand, and it was a package of gummy bears, which was a big deal at the time because that was his favorite snack. He opened up the other hand, and it was $5. I don't know what happened when y'all were growing up, but I grew up in the days of dimes and nickels. Can the church say amen? Anybody? So, you know, I'm trying to be excited for the boy, but really I'm annoyed about this whole $5 situation. And my husband can see that I am troubled. And you know, if mama ain't happy, Nobody said. After Jackson left the room, Jerry came over to me and he said, Priscilla, don't worry. He said, do you remember that last month was Jackson's fifth birthday? He said, do you remember that we had all of the family over? Still to this day, we do that. When one of the boys has a birthday, we invite the whole clan over, grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles. Everybody comes to celebrate. He said, do you remember they all came? Most of them had cards, and in those cards were $5 bills. He said, do you remember we took all those $5 bills and we put them in a birthday drawer in the kitchen? He said, this morning at 3 a.m., I went right inside that birthday drawer. Ramsey would be so proud of us. That's good financial stewardship right there is what that is. <laughs> so that morning, really what I had witnessed was my little boy getting excited about treasure that actually already belonged to him. <laughs> treasure that he already had. He just didn't know it. I came to tell somebody that there is treasure yeah. hidden in these earthen vessels. I came to tell you that by God's Spirit there is gift and there is power that, that has been entrusted to you, that is available to you, available to me as daughters of the Most High King. You need to know that even if you do not believe what the Scriptures declare to be true about your treasure, if you don't believe that you've been forgiven or that you already have the victory or that the enemy is already underneath your feet and that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus or that you have been made competent by the Spirit of God. I came to tell you that even if you don't believe it, the enemy does. He knows who you are. What a shame it would be for him to know and us not to. So it's time for us to open up the drawer and start pulling out the treasure. The treasure we've been ignoring, the treasure we've been calling insignificant, the thing that we've said is not enough, not valuable. Lord, if I could just be like her, Lord, if I could just be like that, if I could just have a bit more of that, if I weren't me, then Lord, I'd be enough. He says, uh-uh, you have enough, you just have to open up the drawer. Pull out the treasure. 
There is a story in scripture that is gonna be very familiar to you. It's the one that the Lord has been using in my own life to remind me about how he will compel me and he will compel us to open up the drawer and reach in and pull out the treasure and see what it's like when he uses what he has already entrusted to us. Luke chapter nine, verse one and two says this. And he called, that's Jesus, he called. Somebody say he called. He called, he called the 12 together and he gave. Somebody say he gave. He gave. he gave them power and he gave them authority over all demons and to heal all diseases, verse two. And then he sent, somebody say he sent. He sent, he sent them out. He called them. He gave them treasure and then he sent them out. Verse 10 says, and then when they returned to him, they gave an account to him of everything they had done. And taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a hill called Bethsaida. The multitudes were aware of this, verse 11 says, so they followed Jesus. Because you know, wherever Jesus went, a crowd was sure to follow. They weren't quite sure he was the Messiah, but what they did know was that when this man showed up, blind people could see. What they knew is that when Jesus showed up, the lame could walk and the deaf could hear, the dead were being raised. So wherever Jesus was, they came. The crowd followed and welcoming the multitude, Jesus began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who were in need of healing, verse 12. So the day starts to come to a close and the 12 come to Jesus and say, now Jesus, you're gonna have to send this multitude away. They've gotta go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging. They got to get something to eat, Jesus. Come on, now here, we're in a desolate place. Verse 13, Jesus said to them, uh-uh, you give them something to eat. They said, Jesus, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps you let us go and buy food for all these people, because you know we're not enough as we are right now. There were about 5,000 men. Scholars say the reason why Luke specifies men is because there were women and children too. So there were probably about 15,000 hungry people that day. Jesus said, have them recline to eat in groups of about 50 each. So they did so, had them all recline. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed them. And then he broke them. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the multitude and verse 17 says they all ate. They were all satisfied. And just so you know how satisfied they were, they went by and picked up all the leftovers because there was overflow. In this story, we meet a hungry multitude, a multitude that is placing a demand. They have a need. There is a lack that needs to be filled. And most of the time when this proportion of the scriptures is looked into, the multitude is who we concentrate on, the five loaves and the two fish and how they were satisfied with it. But just for a few moments, tonight I want to talk to you about the 12 disciples. Those who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, those who were in close communion with Jesus, those who would come out on a Friday night to be in the presence of Jesus, amongst the people of Jesus. I want to talk to the disciples of Jesus. The disciples on this occasion had been called to Jesus by Jesus. They were having a conversation with each other. Jesus entrusted them with power and authority and then he sent them out. I love that this uh, gospel is one of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are those that tell, there are three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These three tell some of the similar stories in a similar tone, in a similar way, so that we're able to get more layers to the story. I love the gospels in that way. They give us layers. Just like if someone were to offer you a chocolate cake, but they gave you options, you could have a one layer chocolate cake or a seven layer chocolate cake. Which one are you gonna choose? Seven every single time because the more layers there are, the more rich and delectable the experience becomes. Mark chapter 6 is a layer of cho chocolate cake for us. It tells us that this is the experience when Jesus called the disciples to himself and then he sent them out in pairs. Do you remember? Two by two into the neighboring towns and communities. They were supposed to teach and preach and perform miracles that would authenticate the deity of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter six, our layer of chocolate cake, tells us that they expended themselves. 
Y'all, they were busy from sunup to sundown. They were about the task of doing what it was that Jesus had assigned to them. They wanted to be diligent about it, so much so that when they came back to Jesus, they gave an account to him and Jesus recognized their exhaustion. He saw that they were tired. In fact, Jesus himself commented that they didn't even have time to eat because they had been so busy. They were depleted and they were tired and they came back to Jesus and they gave him an account for how they'd handled the assignment that he had entrusted to them. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you got an assignment. And don't let anybody tell you that your assignment isn't ministry just because it happens to be in a corporate setting. <laughs> Mother of small children who's chosen to stay home with those kids, don't let anybody tell you that ain't ministry. Every single time you make that chicken for dinner and you set it on that table and you teach those kids a Bible verse before bedtime, don't let anybody tell you that that ain't ministry. <laughs> Corporate woman, when you sit around that boardroom table and you're the only one that has a set of ideals that lines up with the truth of Scripture at a table with those who are thinking and acting and planning in a way that is left of God's Word. Don't let anybody tell you that you around that boardroom ain't ministry. That's ministry. High school student, college student, you're the only student that stands for truth when your professor says this is the way it is and you say, no, that's not the way it is. Don't let anybody tell you as the light on that college campus that you are not in ministry. Every single one of us has an assignment and the day is coming when we're going to have to give an account. And here's the thing, you don't know when that day is. My 38-year-old cousin, 38, four small children, the day is coming and you don't know the day or the hour. Neither do I when we're going to have to stand before him and give an account for how we handled what he had entrusted to us. I'm asking you tonight, how are you handling your assignment? Because young women, if you think that you're young because of your age, listen to me. If you're 20, but you only have till 30, you're pretty old. If you're 50 and you're going to live until 100, then you're pretty young. Age is just a number, my friend, and you and I cannot qualify young or old based, birth, based on our, our birth date. It's based on our death date, and since we don't know when that day is, that I implore you, sisters, by the mercies of God, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you have been called. Because listen, I don't know about y'all, but when I see him face to face, I'm looking for a well done. I'm looking for well done. When I see him, he will not ask me how many Instagram followers I had. He will not wonder whether or not folks liked my post. He will not be interested in whether or not my selfies were perfectly lit. He will ask me, did I know his son? And then I will give an account. So the disciples, they come and they give an account to Jesus. I wondered if there was a recipe for effective ministry. Because if these guys were willing to come and look Jesus in his face and give an account, I figured there might be a recipe for us for effective ministry. I'm interested. Anybody interested? Yes. There are three ingredients to the recipe. Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, he called them. He called them. And his calling superseded any personal ambition that they had. They laid down whatever they were going to do because they heard the call of God beckoning them to do something else. The beautiful thing about that entire picture is that all of the glory of God the Father, all of the glory of heaven was packaged in human flesh. Jesus wanted so much, God the Father wanted so much to make sure that he could speak and so that humanity could hear that he left his throne in glory, put 
on flesh so that the disciples could hear his call. And in the same way, he has given us the Holy Spirit so that each and every one of us have the privilege to hear the calling of God on our lives. The conviction, the unction, the pressing, the fire that is shut up in your bones, sending you in a particular direction. Heed the call of God on your lives. Then they were not just called. I love so much that before he skips to the third uh, ingredient in the recipe, sending them. I love that before we get to the third one, there's that second one. He did not just call, but then he gave them power and authority. It means that what he was calling them to do, he was simultaneously equipping them with supernatural power to be able to pull it off. So it's good news for anybody in the room that you feel like you've got a dream that is way over your head. You've been called to do something you don't have the money for, you don't have the time for, you don't have the patience for, you don't have the gifting for, you don't have the talent for, you don't have the connections for. The good thing and the great thing about our God is that he does not call people who are already equipped. He calls you. And then for the people that say yes, he equips them with what they need for the calling. He entrusted them with power and authority. And can I tell you why this is important? This is important because in order to accomplish supernatural tasks, you have to have supernatural capacity. In other words, you can be the most talented person in the world, but if you go in your own strength and power, you still won't be able to accomplish the God calling on your life. It requires what it is that only God himself can give to you to accomplish the task. Ooh, the enemy hopes you will go in your own power. He hopes you will think you are flashy enough and savvy enough and talented enough and impressive enough so that you will no longer lean on God instead of leaning to your own understanding. But it is not by power, and it is not by might, it is by the Spirit of God. And some trust in horses, other folks trust in chariots, but not us. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. So he called them, and then he entrusted them, he gave them some treasure, and then he sent them. He's the one who did the sending. Resist the urge to send yourself <laughs> to do something that it is not yet time for. Because just as important as our calling is, that is equally as important as the timing is in which that calling is outworked in our lives. And if you go too soon, you might, if you, if you give birth too soon, to that which God is trying to produce through you, you might abort what it is that he's trying to accomplish in you. The spiritual backbone, the fortification that he was trying to establish in you so that you could handle the spotlight when it hits you. Because listen, that spotlight that you may be craving, if it hits you and you have no character, it will burn you to a crisp. So he called them. He entrusted them, he sent them out, and they returned to him and gave an account. They were tired. The disciples had been given it everything they had. And I know there are some of you in the room and you would admit that you haven't done it perf perfectly, but man, you've sure been purposeful. You've been intentional about this marriage, you've been giving it everything you've got. You've been intentional about that teenager. You've been giving that kid everything you got. This toddler that has this specific bent or this specific issue that you've been doing everything you can, going to see every expert that you can, reading everything that you can to be the best that you can. As a mother, single mother, you've been giving it everything that you've got, working the jobs that you've got to work to keep food on the table. You've been giving that business, that ministry, that endeavor, everything that you have, and you, the disciples, Disciples are tired. The good news about Jesus is that when the disciples come to him tired, he does not say, go away from me and get yourself together. Come back and then I can use you. He says, come away with me. In other words, listen, the cure for your exhaustion 
is intimacy with Jesus. That's the cure, y'all. I'm saying, I agree. Take the holiday, take the vacation, tell them you need a little sabbatical. You got to step back for just a little bit. You need a little margin in your life. Take the holiday, but don't take a holiday from Jesus. Don't take the sabbatical from your relationship with the Lord. Prayer shouldn't exit your schedule because these are your rest days. You still need to be the deer that pants after the water. Your soul has still got to be replenished and can only be replenished when you have intimacy with Him. And you're trying to figure out, Lord, you told me that I was going to be replenished. You told me that I was going to be re refreshed. You told me that you had something that you wanted to give to me. Why would you take me here to this place where I'm being pressed down by a multitude of issues and concerns and frustrations? There's something overwhelming me that is bigger than what I feel like I have the capacity to handle, why would you bring me here? This tells us that the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is not just about the 5,000. It's also about the disciples. It's not just about the multitude getting fed, it's about the disciples being fed physically, spiritually, emotionally. And it tells us that the five loaves and the two fish are the gift to the multitude. But it's the multitude that's the gift to the disciples. Because the multitude is what's going to make them have to finally open up their drawer, pull out the treasure that they would have otherwise ignored, place it in the hands of a multiplying master who's going to show them what it looks like when he takes their little bit and makes it a lot. There is no replenishing like watching God multiply your loaves and fish. Tell somebody who's got a multitude pressing on you in your marriage or in your finances or in your health or in your parenting or in your singleness, that thing is weighing down on you. That means that there is a drawer waiting to be opened. That means there's some treasure waiting to be unveiled. And when you take it out, finally, when you stop ignoring it, when you stop circumventing it, when you stop acting like God hasn't given you everything you need, when you will finally recognize this little bit, this little gifting, this little talent, this little time, this little money, this little dream, this little vision, that this is all I need if I'll just pull it out and entrust it to the hands of a multiplying master. Can I just show you real quick what the disciples did? Just real quick, because I think it's interesting because it's so us. They said to Jesus in verse 12, send the multitude away. <laughs> and here's the thing that's so us. See, we don't just say it, we pray it. pray away what we don't even recognize is the gift He has given us to press us into opening up our drawer. So if you pray for your multitude to be taken away and in God's sovereignty He has left it in your life, that means there's a drawer. There's a drawer. Start, start looking for a drawer. If there's a multitude, that means there's loaves and fish somewhere in your life that is supposed to be entrusted into the hands of God. So we pray away. Did you realize in verse 12, they are wishing away what in verse 11, Jesus welcomed. Jesus welcomed what they're wishing away. So the disciples say, get, get this multitude away. They don't even know they're praying away their miracle. Everybody wants to see the Red Sea divide, but nobody wants to be the one that comes face to face with a Red Sea. Everybody wants to see the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, but nobody wants to be the one who has to walk around those walls in obedience to God, to trust Him, to shout prior to seeing one brick fall. If there is a multitude, that means there is a miracle. Okay. 
So praise the multitude, or they ask for the multitude to, to go away, and Jesus, he doesn't go for that. So when he doesn't, they, he doesn't go for that, the disciples have another solution. This is us too. <laughs> Send the multitude away. Jesus says, mm-mm. And they say, well, send us away then. <laughs> you see it? They said, send us to the surrounding towns and villages so that we can go and buy more, accumulate more, get more, because as we are is not sufficient. So send us somewhere else so we can get better and be better suited to this multitude, because as we are is not enough. It has always been the tactic of the enemy to get us to think that we are not enough as we currently are, that what we currently have is not sufficient for the task that is before us. But if the Lord has allowed that multitude into your experience, that means that as you currently are with the entrusted treasure, the power, the authority that he has given to you, you've got everything you need if you just pull out what he already has entrusted to you. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, our layer of chocolate cake, we find out that he says to the disciples, well, what do you have? He asks them that question. He says, what do you have? And then he doesn't even give them a chance to, to answer. He just immediately responds and says, go and look. He said it like that. Go and look. He said it like you would tell your kid if the month, I mean, the week after Christmas, they came to you and said, Mom, I'm bored. <laughs> you would say, well, what do you have? And then before you gave them a chance to respond, because you could already tell that the response they was going to give you was going to get them in trouble. <laughs> so you didn't even give them a chance. You just say, you would say to them, go and because if you'll just look, you'll see that the thing you're complaining about is something you already have access to. If you will go and look, Moses, you will see that everything you need to do what I've called you to do, it's in your hand. It's that rod, that common rod that has always been right beside you, but now I'm going to infuse it with my power. If I can just get you to go and look, Moses, pick the stick up, put it over the Red Sea, you will see that it will make the Red Sea divide like a solid wall. Go and look, David. Yes, Goliath is right there, but if you'll go look down by the stream, I've already provided five smooth stones that will be everything you need to take that giant down. Go and look. Spend all of the energy that you're spending complaining. Spend that energy going to look for what God has already given us access to. So they pulled it out. All right, Jesus, you going to do something with this? They say, okay, here you go. And they put it in his hands. Everything changes when you put your five and two in the hands of Jesus. Everything changes when you stop speaking negatively about it and just trust it into the hands of Jesus. When you just take that little dream that, that he has entrusted to you and you give it back to him and you say, it don't look like much right now, but I'm putting it in your hands. And the great thing about our God, verse 16 says, is that he took the meager gifts of man. He didn't look at their little bit and say, come back when you've got more, uh-uh a holy, divine, almighty, powerful God, a God who does not need us or our loaves and fish. When man gave it to him, he received it. And looking up to heaven, he blessed it. Y'all, you don't need more. You just need God's blessing on what you've already got. You don't need more. You just need God's blessing on your five and two, girl. That's all you need. You know what his blessing is? It's his favor. Y'all, favor is what makes the scales balance over in your favor. Favor is what makes things a little bit unfair on your behalf. Favor is what opens doors that nobody can shut. Favor is what puts you in positions that nobody can take away. Favor is what sets you before kings and queens. The favor of God is what you want on your life, on your 
five and two, looking up to heaven, he blessed it, then he broke it, and he kept giving it to the disciples. And it kept going, and it kept going, and the 12 didn't understand how the little bit they had, ha they had in the beginning had become so much. And their entire multitude, the whole burden was satisfied. And when everybody was satisfied, ooh, somebody say satisfied. satisfied. Ooh, Victoria, I wish we had time tonight, girl. Satisfied. This is not some, you know, happy meal sort of situation here. Mm -mm. This is not a number one on the Burger King drive through This is Sunday afternoon. I'm talking about old school Sunday where your mom started to cook on Saturday night and the yeast rolls were rising and the macaroni and cheese was bubbling and the sweet potatoes were all gooey on the stove and, and every, the sweet tea was going the roast. You know, she started the roast on 200 the night before and let it simmer all night long. Y'all are getting hungry, aren't you? I know. Listen, do you remember how when you came home from church the next day, you ate that and the only thing you could do after that was, that's all you could do. That's why Jesus said, go ahead and have the people recline. Have them get in a posture of expectation that I'm getting ready to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything that they can ask or think. Satisfied, Sunday afternoon kind of satisfied. That's what he does. And they were so satisfied. Y'all, don't even sit down, just stay standing and listen. They were so satisfied. This is how you know how good the meal was. There was leftovers. They started going around, picking up the leftovers, y'all, and guess what? There were 12 baskets full. One basket for each disciple to take home as an overflow of the grace and the blessing of God. I want to pray for any of you who are in this room and you've got a multitude weighing on you. You got to, I mean, that thing is burdening you down and you've never considered the fact that you've already got what you need. You've been thinking this is not enough gifting, this is not enough talent, it's not enough money, it's not enough time. I don't have enough. And Jesus is whispering in your ear tonight, you got enough. J just give it to me. I'm going to multiply it. I'm going to blow your mind with what I'm going to do if you just trust it to me. Anybody got a specific multitude that you need prayer in regards to? Just go ahead and raise your hand. We're going to pray right now. In Jesus' name, Victoria, will you come up with me, please? Just as a pastor in this house, would you just be present in this moment so we can pray over God's people? Lord, right now we entrust every single woman who has her hand raised in particular. We entrust every single one under the sound of our voice, Lord, to your loving care. We thank you that you are sovereign over their lives, Father. We thank you that there is nothing that is in our experience right now that is not first passed through your fingers. And since we know you are good and that you are kind and that your mercy endures forever, then Father, we believe that if you've allowed this multitude, there's something in this multitude we don't want to miss. And so Father, I pray right now that you would change our perspective so we can see in this multitude what you have for us. Don't let us miss it for anything in the world, Lord. And then, Father, I'm going to pray over our five and two. I ask right now in Jesus' name, whatever the five loaves and the two fish are that you have entrusted to every single woman, I pray that you would give a holy courage and a holy boldness yes. that would compel us to open up the drawer and pull it out and entrust it to your hands, Father. God, I do pray that if this multitude has anything to do with the enemy, Lord, if the enemy has assigned an attack on any woman or her family, I pray that his attack would be canceled in Jesus' name and by his blood that has been shed on Calvary. But Lord, if this multitude is of you, 
then right now in Jesus' name, I thank you for it in our lives. Come on and thank Him for it. I thank you for it. And then, Father, we're going to go ahead and get in a posture of abundance. We're going to start living and praying and acting like people who believe that you are the God of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. You can do above all that we ask or think. In Jesus' name. It says, leaving the crowds behind. See, when you're going to not be impressive, that means you're going to have to divorce your identity from the crowd. Leaving the crowds behind. I need to give you this point because some of you won't be able to make it past this moment if I don't give it to you. If you're going to dwell in the deep, your boat is not built for everybody. Leaving the crowds, what did I say? Behind. The Bible says distinctly that other boats followed, but it said that the boat that Jesus had started them out on, everybody was not able to get on that boat. I bet there was a lot of people in the crowd that wanted to get on the boat when Jesus said, hey, I got a mission for us. Let's go to the other side. And literally, they said they moved out, leaving the crowd behind. I keep saying leaving the crowd behind because I believe that God is asking some of you to do that very thing if you're going to dwell in the deep. Leave the crowd behind. Who is on your boat who's weighing you down? Everybody's not going to the deep with you. And you will delay your destination trying to bring a committee to what God called you to. Do you know where I would be right now if I waited for everybody that I thought was supposed to be with me to come with me on this journey? Do you know how many people would still be wandering and drifting if I needed the cosign of everybody else when I already had the cosign of heaven? Your boat is not built for everybody. And the most spiritual thing that you may do this year, because you're going to the deep, is delete them. I'm not talking about if you see them out, you don't, you don't say hello and be cordial. And I'm not talking about cancel culture. I'm talking about concentrated culture. Do you know that if you are distracted, you cannot reach your destiny in adequate time? And so what God is telling you right now is I don't want you to be into cancel culture. I need you to be in concentrated culture. Do you know when a horse, a thoroughbred runs in the Indy, uh, not Indy 500, what do they call it? The Preakness or the, um, um, what is it called? The Kentucky Derby, those horses are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. They have a $15 piece of equipment that they put on their eyes to allow the peripheral vision to be cut off so that they can be concentrated on their lane and the finish line. And I believe that in this year, God is asking us to be concentrated on our lane and the finish line. And that means that everybody can't get on the boat and go to the deep. Well, what do I do, Pastor Mike? I thought, I thought Bobo Nim was going to come with me. I thought Tremaine was going to be able to make this trip. I already got a ring. I already got a ring. I bought her a ring already, Pastor Mike. Are you asking me to get on this boat? And go alone? Are you asking me to actually wait on you? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> anybody out there? Anybody out there? Anybody? I will trust you, I will trust you, I will trust you. This sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a tiger by his toe. Miss Mary, Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black. 
purify, purify. I want to be consumed. You came from heaven to earth to show me something. Because the deep feels stupid. The deep doesn't have friends. The deep is calling me to be separate, consecrated, refined, sanctified. See, these are, these are words in the Bible that we skip over. Like these are when we talk about the blessings, we talk about all that. But then when he says that he will be the one to take us through every storm of life. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been in a storm before? When you were waiting on God, doing the thing he asked you to do. And then out of nowhere... A storm happens? Can I ask you this question? How many people, can we be honest? We're hot at this church, humble, open, and transparent. How many people in some area of your life are in a storm right now? Come on, hands lifted all over the world. You're in a storm right now. What happens when Mark 437 comes up? That I left the crowd, I decided to go to the deep, and this should be easy now because you are with me, right? And look what verse 37 is the whole point of this message. But soon, a fierce storm came up. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, 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 no. That's not possible. It's not possible that I obeyed God. It's not possible that the season was just calm. That's not possible. That I trusted God. I gave him the crazy faith offering. I keep showing up. And then Jesus is the one that told me. To go to the other side. He's the one that told me to move to Tulsa. He's the one that told me to go to that school. He's the one that told me. And then under Jesus' instructions, a fierce storm came? Has your life ever looked like a storm? Because right now, in many of your lives, that's what it feels like and that's what it sounds like. It sounds and feels like, how am I out here? And how I'm going to do what God asked me to do. And what is going on in my life. And I'm out here and it's dark now. And I'm out here and there's nobody helping me. And I'm out here and I don't hear a word from God. What are you saying to me, Pastor Mike? Something you need to know if you're going to dwell in the deep is the anchor does not excuse the storm. This is the lie that so many churches and people have told you for years, and I'm going to shoot it to you straight. You can have Jesus and have a storm. It's better to see it coming than to allow yourself to be fooled and then walk away. The storm is coming whether you have Jesus or not. Your marriage will be tested whether you pray in tongues or not. Your children will have to be taught whether you fast or not. I feel God right now. You will have a challenge that you're going to have to believe God for. Whether you read the word every day or not. I'm going to keep the storm going. Because this is what many of your whole last year looked like. And what we try to do is get down and make a better situation for ourselves. Let me roll my way into another, another school. Let me roll my way into a better relationship. Let me roll my way. Let me roll my way into a new church. You've been to 42 churches. And the storm has not subsided. 
It might mean because God's trying to teach you something in the storm. I need to be even more transparent with you because I, I feel like many people have never done this for you, so I'm going to do it for you. Jesus does not excuse the storm. But can I tell you, Jesus usually escorts you into the storm. God, I thought, hold on, God, I thought you was doing something. I, I thought you was, hold on, no, 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 I'm in the middle. Hold on, oh, no, I'm in the middle. How do I get out of? I, I'm your anchor. Trust and know that I am God. Be still. And wait on me. God, I can't, I can't see daylight. I don't understand why you didn't just tell me to stay on the shore. Because God said the blessings in the deep. Can I prove it to you? Jesus, after he was baptized in water. What ended up happening is that God came down and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then guess what happened? He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He was escorted by God. Some of y'all been calling your storm a devastation. And God said that this is just the destination that I have to create in you. Oh, I feel this thing. The character, the stamina, the wherewithal, the stick to itiveness that you need to be everything I've called you to. And right now, I bet on day 21, Jesus was like, yo, is the storm over yet? And I bet on day 31, he said, is the storm over yet? And some of you have been living in this place in your life. Is the storm over yet? Is the storm going to subside? And for some reason, God doesn't take you out of the storm. He sustains you in the middle of it. I'm trying to show you a practical example of what having an anchor does. And can I tell you something? If you're going to dwell in the deep, listen and write this point down. The deep is not for devastation. It's for preparation. The darkest and deepest places of my life have prepared me for the greatest victories of my life. I remember when me and Natalie had good credit. And we were in a place to be able to buy our first home. And it was sunny sky everywhere. And we got hooked up with a bad contractor. And what ended up happening is we found ourselves in the smack dab middle of a storm. And for three years, my credit went down. We were drained of tens of thousands of dollars. Nobody knew Pastor Mike. I didn't have no books. I didn't have no nothing. I felt like every day God was letting the storm continue to pound on my life. And I was like, God, why? I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm giving. I'm serving the youth. I'm serving Bishop. And God said, this is not a place of devastation. This is a place of preparation. It was in those moments that I learned the tools and the trades that I needed to be able to purchase the Spirit Bank event center that we sit in right now. He knew that if I went through the storm in a season where it was inconsequential, that he would sustain me and I would come out better. And at the other side, it would be the very thing I needed to reach purpose. Maybe you need to rename your storm. Yeah, it sucks, but this is going to be sanctifying. Yeah, it's hard, but somehow healing's coming out of this. John 16, said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Can I say it a different way? In this world, you will have a storm, but take heart. 
I, your anchor, have overcome. Somebody better help me shout in the place today. If you know that our anchor has overcome the world. So dear brothers and sisters, James 1, verse 2 and 4. When troubles or storms of any kind. Oh, that means I can have a storm in my marriage? Any kind of storm. A storm of insecurity? Any kind of storm. A storm of financial poverty, any kind of storm. Dear brothers and sisters, when storms or troubles of any kind come your way, uh-oh, you want to reframe it? Consider it an opportunity for great joy. Hold on. Is my storm a joyful situation? According to the word of God, my storm should bring me joy. Because if I know when your faith is tested... Your endurance has a chance to grow. So let me admonish you like James. Let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. What I started saying to myself in the midst of the storm, because what happened is, Sometimes you think like I got used to the storm and then the lights go dark and then the stuff that used to be very, very clear and that you could see, then it gets, it gets a lot darker. Yeah, yeah, turn all of this off. Turn this. Yeah, 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 because what you think is that now I've learned how to deal in the storm and now I've learned how to communicate and, and work in the storm, but then... It gets darker and then come on keep going like then all I see and hear is the voice of the enemy and I see how they're doing good and I see their marriage succeeding and this little light of mine is not shining and then Mark 4 37 said high waves <laughs> we're breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water so the storm got more intense and the lightning started to go and the things started to begin to be more and I'm about to lose my house and my family doesn't want to invite me places anymore and things are starting to rock and starting to reel and things are not looking brighter but it's looking darker and I don't know what's happening where is Jesus have you ever said, where is Jesus? Look what verse 38 tells us Jesus was doing. Give me a little light on myself. Jesus was at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. No. Jesus was sleeping. The greatest storm of my life is happening. And Jesus had a Flintstone pillow and took residence. I, 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 I need you to see this. Trying to navigate in the midst of a shaky situation. Y'all know when the storm is happening, nothing's sure. Where's Jesus? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Holy, holy, holy. Yeah, that's going to be a hit. That's going to be a hit. What happens when Jesus has decided to sleep? What happens when Jesus has decided to sleep in the midst of your storm? Do you still trust him? Will you still wait on him? And people are saying, yeah, right now. But there's a lot that goes into Trusting a God who seems idle when your situation 
is so dark. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care that everything around me is shaking? And Jesus wakes up. Is this what y'all woke me up for? Who told you to go to the other side? Y'all missed it. Is this what you woke me up for the storm? That when I told you we were going to the other side, I'm the God of all knowing. So I knew there would be a storm and I decided to sleep in it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. Our fears are the cages that hold us back. If we're talking about the lions were in that cage, well, the bottom line is I think for many of us, we are caged in by our fear. If God has not sent us a spirit of fear and fear is so rampant on the earth, do the math. Guess who sent it? And if you were the devil and you wanted to cripple and immobilize the body of Christ, what would you send? You would send a spirit of fear. You would send the very thing that God did not send in order to take Christians out. And so what we need to do is stop being scaredy cats. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. There's a reason why God tells us this is not from me. God doesn't want us locked in, caged and trapped like those, island, like those lions at Taronga Zoo. That's not what God wants for our life. So many of us are just paralyzed by our fears rather than living the abundant life that Jesus Christ has called us to live. We are paralyzed by the fear of what other people think. That would be one of the biggest ones. And you know what? Ultimately, it really doesn't matter what other people think. What does God think? If I would not be doing anything I'm doing today if I cared what other people think. My family thinks I'm crazy in case you wonder what they think. Not my one, my husband and my kids, but my family of origin. Because you know what? If I tried to please them, there would be no A21. There would be no Propel. There would be no television program because I would be the good Greek girl sitting at home cooking baklava right now, breeding many more children. Well, not anymore because I can't, but back in the day, okay. <laughs> but you know what? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that wasn't the only thing God had called me to do. And so many of us, we settle because our mum might not be happy or our father might not be happy, or the teacher might not be happy, or our friends. How many of our destinies have we put on hold in order to impress our friends and to stay down where we are? Fear that I'm not good enough. So many of us just think we're not good. Look, let me put you out of your misery. To do what God has called you to do, you're not good enough. You feel good? I'm not good enough. Uh, you know, what God has called us to is a supernatural destiny. You cannot fulfill a supernatural destiny with natural ability. So your best natural ability is not good enough to do what God has called you to do. The gap between what God has called you to do and where you are is here and there will always be the gap. It's called the God gap. And so I need God. That's the faith gap. That's where God takes me into doing what I can't do. But that's where His strength is made perfect in my weakness. That's the grace gap. Do you think I could run 15, 8, 21 offices in 11 countries around the world? No, no. Do you think I could be putting traffickers in jail or rescuing? No. Do you think I'd be running Propel Women around the world? No, I don't have the ability. It is all outside of my skill set. I've never been trained in television. I've never been trained in that kind of community. This is all outside of my skills. If God does not show up, I'm toast. <laughs> so let me put you out of your misery. You're not good enough. Okay, so that settles that in case you think I'm not good enough. Fear of failure, that is a really big one. What if I fail? Well, what if you succeed? And what if you fail? Get back. A failure is highly overrated. What are we all so scared of failing for? Big deal. Big deal. Get back up and have another go. You know, we're fear of danger or harm. Well, I already talked to you in session one that you can't avoid it. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. At the end of the day, you can take checks and balances, but I get on a plane nearly every day. I cannot, I'm not the pilot and I'm not, I have to trust that the person 
that is putting the gas in and that the person that's checking the tyres and the person that's checking the little screws that hopefully keep the wings attached, one hopes. You know, all of those things. At the end of the day, I'm going to have to let go and trust God. So if I was thinking about fear and danger all the time, I would not travel. I could not do. If I was always worried about what about my kids? What about? Now, I do all my due diligence. There is never an excuse for not doing due diligence. But you have got to have faith to step out and say, God, I'm trusting you to fill the gap that I can't fill. And we would do a whole lot more for Jesus if we actually trusted him in that gap. Fear of the unknown. Well, the fact is, if we're walking in faith, we're always walking into the unknown. The Bible says of Abraham that he went forth, I love this part, not knowing where he went, to a land that he would recognise when he got there. When was the last time you didn't know where you were going? We are so fearful. I've got to have it all mapped out. Here's my five-year plan. Here's my 10-year plan. This is where it works out. I'm going to have this much money. I'm going to do this. You have a box for everything. You have an app for everything. And what happens if the app breaks? The fact is, you know, I don't even live that kind of life. And I run major global organisations. I have a basic trust in God fact. I do all due diligence. I do a basic plan. But I'm like, Father, this is yours. I don't really know. where People go, where you go? I don't know. But I get up every day and I say, Jesus, I don't know where you're going today, but I'm coming wherever you're going. That's, that, that's my bottom line. If you're wondering, that's about the extent. I'm going wherever he's going. And so that means don't box me too much. Is she just rescuing the victims of traffic? Yes. And is she helping women? Yes. And is she doing tele? Yes. And is she teaching the Bible? Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Wherever. You're not going to fit me in a box because I'm not here to fit into your box. I'm here to obey Jesus as he walks forward. And so that's what we need to do with our lives. And so everything that I have done, everything has been out of my comfort zone just so that, you know, anything that is bearing fruit, that remains, has got the touch of God on it. It's not what I've been able to do. You know, I, when I went to church in, 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 when I was 21, well, you know, for a Greek Orthodox girl to walk into a Protestant church and to then give my life to Christ and continue to walk on route, that, that was, I was ostracized. People, my family members did not speak to me for three years. I was not included in any family. You know what? It was a step of faith to go, I, I didn't see this in my future. I didn't know what was ahead. I couldn't see 30 years in advance. I could just see that my family wasn't talking to me, that my friends ridiculed me because they thought, you're the loser. How'd you become a Christian? Where'd your brain go? You know, that's what kind of happened. And now we look at it 30 years later and go, wow. But I didn't know what was here when I started. But I had Jesus there and that's who I was following. And Jesus brought me here. That's how it goes into the future as well. I left my job to go into ministry. I was in a very high paying, lucrative job to go into ministry where I wasn't paid barely for seven years. It didn't make any sense, but it took risk because that's what God called me to do. You know, when I started the youth center, I didn't know anything about youth ministry and had to trust God to grow. When I was a youth evangelist, filling arenas, talking to thousands of young people about Jesus, no one trained me. I didn't know what I was doing. When we started 821, there wasn't a course I went to, how to grow a global anti-trafficking organization. When we started Propel Women, I, I didn't go and read a textbook on how to run a, a, a movement for women who lead and to help women internalize the leadership identity. You know, everything I think about when I got married with my broken past of abuse and abandonment, there was a huge faith risk to trust God that this was the next step for me. I never thought I would have children because I didn't want that. I was so broken. So then when I really felt the Lord say, okay, and then he gives me two daughters. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what a risk of faith that was for me mm -hmm. to think I, I don't want my kids screwed up in any way. So the fact is to become who God wants you to become, to do what God's called you to do, it's always going to take risk personally, emotionally, relationally, financially, physically, in every realm of life. Some of you are so caged by fear that you're not going to step into that relationship because your parents got divorced or because there was some brokenness. And what you've done is you've allowed that to trap you. You haven't given your heart. You won't trust serving in church because somewhere along the line, maybe someone hurt you or, or abused your trust somewhere along the line. It is amazing how we have just become like those lions caged in by our fear. What if, what if, what if? How about you replace what you do not know about the future with what you do know about Jesus. And you know that your God is good. You know that your God does good. And you know that your God will work all things together for 
good. So why don't you trust the goodness of God versus what you don't know about the future? The world is cray cray. There is no bow. Uh, here is red alert. It's just going to get increasingly cray cray. So why don't you put all your eggs in the basket of Jesus and trust Jesus who is good and who does good. Step out of the boat, take a risk of faith and do the thing that God has called you to do. I have discovered that what is impossible with man is possible with God. I have discovered that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that you could ever ask, hope or think. I know that my eyes have not yet seen nor my ears heard nor has it entered into my heart the things that God has for me. I know that with my God I can advance against a troop and I can climb any wall. I know that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I do not have to bow down to fear. Self-doubt will kill more dreams than anything ever will. Self-doubt will kill more dreams than failure ever will. You know what? You're going to have to press through your limitation. You're going to have to work with what you've got. You're going to start where you are. You need tenacity. We need courage. We need resilience. We need patience. We need boldness. We need to take risks. I love this scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 to 8. It's the Lord said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous for you shall go with his people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I said it twice because it's worthy of being said twice. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. It is God that is calling you to cross over. It's time to get up, step up, step out in faith, take a risk, do what God has called you to do, become who God has called you to become. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't let fear, doubt or negativity keep you here trapped. It's time to cross over. It's time to break camp. It's time to advance and go in and possess the promises of God for your generation in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let me pray for you. So Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are a faithful God that has called us to live an adventurous, daring, purpose-driven, passionate life full of risk and full of faith and full of hope. Thank you, God, that you've not called us to a tame, domesticated, boring religious existence, but you've called us to a wild, glorious unpredictable, faith-filled adventure. And we thank you that you've promised to never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you are with us in every situation. Give people the strength and courage, just like you said to Joshua, the strength and courage to do the thing that you've called them to do in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.